Okay, so thanks everyone for joining me this evening. And uh, tonight we're going to uh, talk about the gentler sex, which is a, I think is a sexist reference to women. So forgive me on that one. Um, in 2019, a survey was run by Israel 21C, which is an online magazine, quite a good one actually. And uh, Israelis were asked to um, tell the magazine who were the most inspiring Israeli women. And you won't be surprised to learn that number one choice was Golda Meir. Uh, I was a little bit surprised by the number two choice of uh, Dr. Ruth, because um, I didn't think Dr. Ruth was even an Israeli. Um, the others, Dorit Benish, she was a president of the Supreme Court, Nomi Shema, um, was a song, very famous songwriter, the most famous songwriter. Um, other names that are there, I won't go through all of them. Gal Gadot, no surprise that she's on the list. Um, Adina Bar Shalom, now actually she's quite interesting. She um, is involved in all kinds of um, public works. She's actually the daughter of um, Avadja Yosef. But anyway, um, we're interested, or I'm interested in history, so I was tempted to talk about Golda Meir, but I decided not to, because I think everything has been written about Golda Meir. So I thought, okay, if we ran this, um, the same survey a hundred years ago, who would be on the list? And the three women that I have on the list are Henrietta Sold, um, Sarah Owenson, and Rachel Blustein. So we'll discuss each one of those um, in turn. So first of all, Henrietta Sold, she was born in 1860 in Baltimore, USA. And, um, her crime was that she was a woman. She was one of um, eight children. She was, the, she was the, the oldest of eight children, born to um, a rabbi, Binyomim Sold, um, who was pretty well known. And she undoubtedly, she would have become a rabbi and a well-known um, figure in, um, in Talmudic uh, way of life if she would, hadn't have been a woman. But anyway, she, she was a, um, a Jewish instructress. She taught for 15 years in Miss Adam's school and in the Oheb Shalom religious school. She was allowed to be a teacher providing that she didn't, didn't, uh, um, and she actually, she studied, she studied Talmud as well the, on the condition that she wouldn't try and become a rabbi. Um, she was also, um, she started her pioneering work. So she set up a night school for um, Jewish Russian immigrants who were flowing into the USA in large numbers, and somebody had to teach them English, which she did. In uh, 1896, Henrietta Sol described her vision of a Jewish state in Palestine as a place to ingather diaspora Jewry and revive Jewish culture. And of course, this was um, two years before Theodore Herzl would publish a very, very similar um, message in his book, uh, The Judenstadt. Um, in uh, 1898, so she became a Zionist. In 1898, she was elected onto the Council of the Federation of American Zionists. And in 1909, she would make her first trip to Palestine. And it was really um, the making of her. In 1912, she founded, together with five other women, she founded Hadassah. And this is really what she's known for until to this day. So Hadassah, um, was uh, funded mainly by American money, which she raised herself. And um, it was pioneering in setting up a nursing program, a dental and medical school, an x-ray clinic, soup kitchen, infant welfare in Ottoman Palestine for Jews and for Arabs alike. At a time, there was basically no health care for anyone. <coughs> Excuse me. In um, 1918, she uh, raised money for the American Zionist Medical Unit, which would send 44 doctors and hundreds of tons of medical equipment to Palestine during the war. Uh, remember, 1918 was uh, the time that the uh, British Ameri the Allies invaded Palestine, and there was a war going on in Palestine, which would uh, claim about 15,000 Allied lives. In 1920, Henrietta Sold moved to Palestine and she would rapidly become known as the mother of the Yishuv on the back of all the uh, public works and uh, um, uh, public work schemes that she was involved in. And this would lead to her in 1931 being elected on the Vaad Lumi, which was the precursor of what we know today as the Knesset. 
In 1933, she was appointed director of Youth Aliyah, which was an organization that um, was trying to get Jewish youth out of Germany. And um, she was active even later, late in her life. 1940, she was already 80, and she founded Le, Le, Le Man Hayeled, which was a social program for um, children of Jerusalem. In 1945, she died in Hadassah in Hospital on Mount Scopus, which she founded and she built, and she was buried on the Mount of Olives. Her grave would be lost um, in the period between 1948 and uh, 1967, when the Jordanians kindly paved over her, or, or put a road over her grave. But um, it was uh, worked out afterwards where her grave was, and her grave, grave was reconsecrated consecrated in after 1967. <clears throat> Sarah Aronson, who was Sarah Aronson? She was born uh, 30 years after Henrietta Sol. She was born in Zichron Yaakov. She was the daughter of one of the original founding families of Zichron Yaakov, which was founded in 1882. And she was a student of languages, so she knew um, Hebrew, Arabic, Yiddish, um, she, she knew French and she taught herself English as well. In 1915, she married Chaim Avraham, who you see in the picture below. He was a wealthy Istanbul Jewish merchant. Uh, Sarah Aronson left Zichron Yaakov and moved to Istanbul to be with her, her husband, but the marriage was not a happy one and broke up um, less than a year after they got married. And Sarah returned to uh, Palestine. On her way, she bore witness to the, Amer to the Armenian genocide, which, would, um, start, which started in 1915 and would eventually lead to over a million Armenians being butchered by the Ottomans. And this was perhaps one of the main factors that convinced Sarah Aronson that she couldn't sit idly by uh, whilst a war was going on and that she had to have an active part in uh, defeating the Ottoman Turks. And it was to this end that she founded, together with her sister Rivka, her brother Aaron, that they founded the Nili, which was uh, aspiring, which was, uh, Nili stands for Netze Yisrael Lo Yishaker. And uh, this ring was formed um, in 1915. Um, the whole story of the Nili is, is a lecture in itself, but essentially um, it involved um, her brother had freedom of movement because he was an agronomist. He was an agronomist, sorry. He was on good terms with the Ottomans and they needed him to deal with a swarm of locusts that um, plagued through Palestine in 1915. So he had freedom of movement and he was able very much to map out both where Ottoman troops were located and also passages through the desert which the British used in their invasion of Palestine in 1917 and 1918. Um, <clears throat> in uh, September of 1917, the Nili spy ring had a, a fate of bad luck. One of the uh, pigeons that they used to carry messages around was intercepted by Caesarea by um, the governor of Caesarea, and there lived um, a large number of Bosnian Muslims who were sympathetic to the Ottomans. Um, on the back of that, the spy ring was broken. Sarah Aronson was captured and uh, taught, brutally tortured by the Ottomans. Um, on the 5th of October, surprisingly, she requested permission to go home and change her clothes, which, had her, which were full of her own blood. And uh, the Turks marched her back into her home. She went into the bathroom where she had uh, hidden a pistol. She stuck the barrel of the pistol into her mouth, squeezed and um, blew out her mouth, damaged her spinal cord, but uh, unfortunately didn't succeed in blowing out her brains and killing herself. Um, Hilo Liafe was the uh, doctor he was called uh, Aronson begged him to administer her uh, with a lethal dose, but he administered her uh, with morphine. And four days later, on the 9th of October, Sarah Aronson passed away. Um, on the right hand side, you can see a picture of youth from the Beitar organization, which were Jabotins, uh, Jab allied to uh, Vladimir Jabotinsky. They were allied to the Etzel. And this is a picture that was taken in 1942 of them paying homage at Sarah's grave. And the grave you can visit in Zichron Yaakov, it hasn't changed at all. You can still see the gravestone of Sarah 
of Malka Aronson, who is, Sarah, who is Sarah's mother, and the graves are surrounded by a metal fence. And the reason for that is to separate their graves, to separate the grave of a Jewish woman who committed suicide from the other Jewish graves in the uh, cemetery, since in those days, um, there were um, somebody who committed suicide wasn't allowed to be to be buried in the main Jewish cemetery. And from the tragic story of Sarah Aronson, we'll move to also somewhat of a, a beautiful but a tragic story. We'll talk about Rachel Blustein, who is the poetess of Israel. She was born in 1890, so in the same year as uh, Sarah Aronson, but she wasn't born in Palestine, she was born in Russia. Um, shortly after her birth, her family moved to the Ukraine, and, um, and uh, Rachel would start to write poems from the age of 15, and she would also become known as an accomplished painter. In um, 1909, so the same year actually that uh, Henrietta Sold first came to Palestine, Sarah visited Palestine with her sister for the first time and they were so entranced by the land that they decided to stay as volunteers originally in Rehovot. Um, shortly after that they moved to the um, settlement of Kinneret and they would live in, they would become part of Kfutsat Kinneret and live in the Maidens Farm which was um, an agricultural farm set up for um, Jewish women pioneers under the guidance of Hannah Meisels. Um, it was here in Kinneret, this was the, the place of the second Aliyah, and Rachel would become very influenced by second Aliyah pioneers, particularly A.D. Gordon, and he persuaded her to also become an agro agronomist and to further her education in France. And to this end, in 1913, she traveled to Toulouse. However, shortly after she got there, World War I broke out. France wasn't a good place to be. And she also wanted to be of um, benefits to Jews and to contribute to the uh, war effort. So she decided to travel to her homeland of Russia. And it was there during the uh, war years between 1913 and 1918 that she would look after poverty-stricken Jews and particularly look after children. And it was um, during the extreme uh, difficult conditions of World War I in Russia, famine, disease, poverty, that um, she was, um, she, she had a flare up of uh, lung disease, which apparently she had from child, childhood. And also probably during those years, she uh, contracted tuberculosis. Anyway, by 1919, she was desperate to get out of Russia. She took the first boat out of Russia and sailed back to Palestine. And um, this, in, in 1919, she returned not to Kinneret, but to the nearby kibbutz of Deganya. There she could, oh, she stayed for a few months looking after the children, but she was asked to leave by the kibbutz due to the risk of her tuberculosis infecting the children. She moved to Jerusalem. She lived on, uh, now we're in 1920, she lived on Rechov Nivi in the Street of the Prophets, where you can still visit her house today. Um, and then from 1920, for the rest of her life, she lived in Tel Aviv. And it was in 1920 that she published, um, she published her first poem. This was published in a weekly periodical called Dvar, who the, um, the editor was Zalman Shazar, who later would become the third president of the state of Israel. And Rachel's poetry, by the way, most of her poems were actually written between 1925 to 1931 in the last six years of her life. Her poems, many of them are, are very sad, echo her, her own feelings of longing of, and loss, um, of being unable to work the land and also to be of, of her inability to realize the aspirations in her life. Of course, one of those was to um, fall in love, get married and have her own child, which she, because of her illness, she was unable to do. Um, her, her poems also echo tragic biblical um, figures, um, one of them being Rachel, the wife of Yaakov, who died in uh, childbirth, another one being Michal, the uh, wife of King David. 
And sadly, Rachel died in 1931. She lived for a time, she, she, she lived her last days in a, a sanitarium in a sanatorium in Gadera, and she died in 1931 at the young age of 40. And her grave um, <coughs> you can visit in the cemetery of Kinneret, um, Nomi Sheme, who um, encompassed the words of Rachel into the famous songs of Israel youth in the 1960s and 1970s. Nomi Shemer is buried there by the side of Rachel, the poetess. <clears throat> um, Rachel, as I mentioned, her poems were published in 1920 by Shazar, but she first met Shazar in 1911. And uh, he describes the morning that he, ve he visited kin the Kinneret Farming Collective and he saw Rachel, the poetess, from afar. And this is how he describes it. Of that morning, and then the gate opened, and out of the courtyard came a row of white geese, roaring, rolling, and spreading down the hill, and following them a herder, white-gowned and blue-eyed, light as a gazelle and beautiful as the kineret. That herder was Rachel, the poetess. And... Um, the poems of uh, Rachel, as I mentioned, would be put into song by Nomi Sheme. There was also a group that put out a famous song in 1969 dedicated to Rachel and using the words of a poem. The group is Chalanot Hagvoim, which uh, amongst others included the late and uh, Miss Arik Einstein. <laughs> Sad. 